difficulties that we're, we're facing now? What, what might be the, the next extensions to the, the value philosophy? I mean, uh, there was a lot of money to be made by selling short last year. I mean, is, is that a, okay. a, a natural extension of the, of the value philosophy? I think that the answer is it has not been. Mm. And I think except in extreme circumstances properly so. Shorting is a painful and dangerous thing to do. Yeah. So when you short, you have to put the money in short-term treasuries. Stocks outperform, depending on the period, short-term treasuries or you know, reliable short-term instruments by somewhere between 4 and 6%. Right. So you've got the wind in your face when you short. Second thing is that the tax treatment of short profits is just brutal. Right. All short gains are, I mean, sorry, all short sales are short-term capital gains. Right. And so they're taxed at the full income tax rate, at least in the United States. And that treatment is also overseas in many instances. But the third thing is that shorting is incredibly risky. Right. So when a position goes against you in a short, the position gets bigger. So it goes from 100 to $200. It doesn't get to be a smaller part of your portfolio. It gets to be a bigger part of your portfolio. So the risks in shorting snowball. And Ben Graham is all about avoiding risk. He wants prices so low that almost nothing can hurt you because it's already discounted in it. So if you are going to short, and there have been successful short sellers, hey, <laughs> you have to be very careful what you do. You probably want to do it episodically, like the end of the internet boom, like Japan in the right. 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, when markets have clearly gone crazy. And that's really not a value philosophy, uh, per se. I mean, various people who call themselves value investors made money shorting Lehman they, and Fannie and right. various others last year. But that's, because, uh, and I think it's partially within the tradition, because you're hmm. certainly looking at what they're trading for and what you think the underlying value is. And I think actually the safer times to have done it were at the tail of the internet boom where stocks with no earnings were trading for many multiples of sales at the end of the Japan boom when things were trading at 100 times earnings. But I think that the core of the value philosophy is not just sort of saying, is this overvalued or misvalued? Is Mr. Market doing something mm. crazy here? And can I take advantage of it? But really it's an approach to a long-term investment right. strategy that you buy things, you buy them at a good price, the earnings accrue over time, you get a good bargain on those earnings, and you get to sit home and enjoy the benefits of that good discipline decision. And that's not what happens with shorts. On the subject of the, some of those big successful shorts last year, it leads to the issue of value traps in that some of the uh, very well-known value investors bought financials because they looked cheap. Yes. Uh, and it didn't work out, uh, to put it mildly. I mean, how, how does one avoid value okay. traps? What, what, were the, what were the key determinants on whether, whether you call the, the banks last uh, okay. year? Okay, right if or you got caught, and let me talk about not the banks, but really a much more present mm. uh, example, which is Fannie and Freddie. Right. The problem with the people who got caught is that if you looked at the earnings power, of Fannie and Freddie, and the value investors piled in when the prices had come down right. from like 60 to 30. They were, all the banks who'd been, tried to get into the business had been scared out. They were raising rates and cooperating on rates. It looked like Freddie, for example, was going to be able to make about $4 billion a year. At a minimum, that was going to be worth $40 billion. Right. And that's the calculation people did. And what they forgot, because again, they focused on the Buffett part of the equation, was where Graham started, which was the balance sheet. Right. And Freddie had $750 billion of mortgage assets. Thornburg at the time had just done the last CMO to come off, which was no alt A, no subprime, no, you know, California, right. Florida, Nevada, Arizona, and they'd done it at a 7% discount. You apply the 7% discount to the $750 billion, it's a $50 billion loss, and all the value of the franchise is gone. I think all the people who got in trouble did it by making highly levered bets without paying a lot of attention to the balance sheet. So I think what happened was that they were blinded, if you will, by the Buffett franchise success. Right. And they forgot that there are assets and leverage in particular 
can be incredibly destructive. Right. Now let's try switching to the, the situation we now find ourselves in. Obviously there was quite a market event last year and there's been quite a, a rally this year. How do you, uh, how c could we have foreseen what hit us last year and how can we explain the, the, the uh, strength of the rebound that we've had in the last six months? I think the answer to the first thing is, and I'm now going to speak in my uh, hmm. persona as a value investor, not as a macro right. <laughs> economist, because as a value investor, yeah. the anticipated damage to the economic system is not something value investors concentrate on. You're looking for comparative opportunities within the market. You're looking for comparatively ugly. Never really occurs to you that everything is going to be right. so ugly that things are going to get destroyed. Now, you still would have saved yourself if you had been careful about balance sheets. You would have right. avoided the worst. But stocks that really had relatively safe balance sheets, like American Express, still fell to a sixth of right. their value. And I think part of that is the economic climate. And I think one of the things that value investors are beginning to do is to think much more carefully about the range of economic possibility and the range of vulnerability to that economic possibility as a result of last year. But I don't think realistically they were the people who were going to anticipate that. Right. In terms of the rally, I think that's a classic value move. I mean, I know at the bottom when American Express is 10 and the minimum sustainable earnings are $3 a share, so it's a 30% right. return, obviously they're going to buy that because it's not going to get that bad. Right. And that's a classic overreaction right. of people being sure that things are never going to get better again. And that's a value opportunity. But don't forget, when the market goes down 50 and up 50, it's down 75. Sure. Now, have we largely seen the end of the, the compelling value opportunity we saw back in March? Though? The I mean, truly it's... compelling opportunities are gone. Right. On the other hand, it depends what you think of as a compelling opportunity. If we were mm. sitting here in the summer of 2006 or the summer of 2007, our idea of a good value would be a lot laxer than it is today. Sure. We would buy stocks with earnings returns of 7 or 8% because they had a little bit of growth, so the overall return was 10%. Now, those stocks are available with earnings returns of 10%, with strong franchises. The lovely thing about a franchise is that you don't have price competition. Right. So if we get stagnation, you're not going to be undermined. And because you've got pricing power, if inflation takes off, it's probably the best inflation hedge out there. Right. So in historical terms, those stocks are still trading at good values, a lot of them. The problem is that you get spoiled. Right. So you see a 30% return on American Express when it doubles and that return goes down to, or triples, and that return goes down to 12, the earnings return is 10 or 11 or so. Yeah. And uh, you've got some growth on top of that. Now you start to disdain a 14, 15% return. So I think that there are still reasonably compelling opportunities out there in historical terms. But the moment, which was like the 1974 moment, right. is gone. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> final question, looking to, the, uh, looking to the future. Obviously, uh, a lot of assumptions have been shaken up. The belief in efficient markets is probably over at this point. So, I mean, where do you see, what, what sort of long-term changes do you see in the way that we invest, in the way that the asset management industry is organized as a result of the okay. last couple of years? I think that efficient markets have always been dead in the asset management industry. And let me say why I believe right. that. Remember that the average return has to be the average return of all assets. Yeah. That's before fees. Hmm. So this is zero-sum game. And people are still paying fees of probably 1% of all those assets when the return is maybe 7 right. So they're spending 40% right. of their asset income in pursuit of something that they can't succeed in on right. average. So there's always been that irrationality, and there's this enormous industry that exists on the back of it. Right. I think, secondly, that literally now for 20 years, the leading finance departments have not believed in the tr traditional form of efficient markets. They've looked at Daniel Kahneman or right. whatever. Right, all, all, all those things. Right. They've looked at the data. I mean, you know, Gene Fama, who is...